All right. Well, welcome everyone. It is uh, now 3.02 p.m. So thank you for joining us for the second in a Housing Forward Massachusetts series of candidate conversations uh, with the candidates uh, running for Boston mayor. Uh, we are joined today uh, by city councilor at large, uh, Anissa Asabi George, uh, a councilor who I had the privilege of serving with uh, for several years on the Boston City Council. I want to thank her for being here with us um, and we'll get kicked off officially in, a, in just a minute or two. I also wanna thank our team at Housing Forward Massachusetts, uh, Kendall Feynman in particular, as well as our board, as well as community partners like Abundant Housing uh, Massachusetts, which really helped us uh, spread the word uh, about these uh, ongoing discussions. Uh, as those of you who registered know, uh, this series will be recorded, posted on our website, housingforwardma.org. Uh, it's also being live streamed to our Facebook page. If you have questions, you can enter them in the Q&A tab. Time permitting, uh, we'll get to as many as we can. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for being here. Um, as a baseline for this discussion, uh, we're using Housing Forward Mass's report, um, a blueprint for Boston's next mayor on how they can increase housing production uh, across the city to improve and really solve some of the affordability challenges we're facing with. So as I said, my name is Josh Zakem, Executive Director of Housing Forward Massachusetts. Thanking everyone for being here. Um, we're gonna have a great discussion uh, with Councilor Asabi George, and I'm just gonna launch into a couple of the high points from our report, Councilor, um, and then if you'd like to you know, talk about some of those, dig in, uh, share more about your philosophy um, when it comes to housing uh, development and permitting processes in the city of Boston and what we can do to increase the supply. So to start off with some facts and figures, um, the report Housing a Changing City, uh, which was uh, launched under the prior mayoral administration, estimates that the city of Boston needs 69,000 new housing units by 2030 to house our growing population. Uh, and the population by 2030 is estimated to be around 760,000 people. That's significant growth. Um, it's also somewhat frightening, challenging when we see the affordability uh, issues that we're facing already. And with more people coming to the city of Boston, we wanna make sure that they have a place to live and that long-term residents, uh, people who built our neighborhoods are able to stay here uh, and live and thrive uh, in an equitable city of Boston. Some of the ideas that we propose in our report and that we'd like to discuss today are things like an expedited uh, permitting process along with dedicated staff for affordable uh, middle-income housing, looking at the issues around parking minimums, particularly for affordable projects, looking at um, helping folks uh, become first-time home buyers. Um, we'd love to hear about thoughts on appointees to the Zoning Board of Appeal, the BPDA, the Zoning Commission, um, and then what your first uh, agenda item would be uh, as mayor when it comes to housing. And we come at this from the perspective of increasing the supply in the city of Boston. As we all know uh, from your time on the city council and as a resident uh, councilor, um, you know, some of the challenges and some of the delays that come in place. And that obviously adds to cost, adds to the scarcity. Um, and would love to hear your thoughts uh, on this. I realize I said a lot. Um, feel free to, to jump on one part of it, uh, talk about some other initiatives, um, and we'll get this conversation going. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. And I'm also a little bit of a note taker. So I've taken a few uh, notes here. So I make sure that we are engaging in a conversation that you want to have and that everyone tuned in today is interested in. First, you know, yes, I agree. Boston does not have enough housing, especially for a city that will continue to grow uh, well beyond 2030. And so as we prepare for and look towards 2030 and what we expect our population growth to be by then, we need to make sure that we're building the housing to not just uh, recruit and uh, attract talent and, and new residents to the city as we need to continue to do, but that we're also creating the type of housing that both encourages but also says out loud to our city's families to our city's older residents that this is a place that you want we want you to be this is a place where we want you to to live i think it's also important and, and something that needs to happen even before 
um, I take over as mayor of the city, as leader of the city, we need to define the term affordability because we use it in very sort of broad brushstrokes. And along the spectrum of affordability, there are lots of different um, demographics and needs among our city's residents to meet that their definition of what's affordable, what's truly affordable. I often find myself saying affordable, affordable housing, like making sure that it is truly affordable and that the, the AMI, the area median income uh, percentage that we're using as a city, when we think about our city's growth and the percentage of affordable housing um, that we're building in the city really does truly reflect the AMI of our city as a whole and then neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, and then the other thing that I just want to say and, and hope that we can speak to a little bit today is the important role that home ownership plays in our city's future. And as our city does continue to grow, and as I, as, as mayor, as a city councilor today, as a, a part of a family of six, four children, we need to make sure that we are creating those ownership opportunities for our city's families um, to set down those roots, to grow their families and, and to really be a part of this city's future. But I'd love to just very quickly also introduce myself to those that are tuned in today. Um, Josh, you mentioned you and I have uh, served on the city council together. I've been a member now of that body and as an at-large councilor for the last almost six years. I am born and raised in the Dorchester neighborhood of Boston. If listening to me for the last few minutes hasn't already indicated that, I do, I do know that I've got a strong Boston accent. Although I am the daughter of immigrants, both my parents immigrated to the United States. My mother is a young child, she is Polish. My father is a young man, he is an Arab from Tunisia. And my mother's parents, my grandparents were able to buy a home here in Dorchester in, in the house that I grew up in. And they bought a house that had a storefront uh, on Dorchester Ave. Because it had that storefront, my grandfather was a TV and radio repairman, and he was able to operate his business out of that storefront and really provide for his family. And um, for me, when we think about our neighborhoods, when we think about our housing stock, when we think about um, our city's people, we have to make sure that we are providing all of the things that families and our city's residents need when it comes to housing and when it comes to that commercial space. I think although we are talking about housing, many of the principles that we're going to talk about today also apply to the commercial district, the commercial industry, and you know, ways for us to explore supporting our small business owners. And the last thing I'll say, and it, it may be a, a topic of discussion today, as we continue to recover from this pandemic, and as we see some uncertainty ahead with perhaps a, uh, another surge or this Delta surge or the impacts of some of the breakthrough infections that we're seeing, we have seen the tremendous impact that this virus has had on our commercial market. And could there be, and I ask those that are doing this work every day in housing, could there be opportunities to think creatively and innovatively about some of our commercial space that is in the pipeline? Um, is there opportunity to uh, retrofit, to think creatively about how we're using that space, perhaps to fulfill some of the demands on our housing market across our city? So with that, I'll um, get back to your questions in this conversation. Thank you, Councillor. I think that's that's really helpful. And and I would say, you know, your mention of, of commercial needs um, and how the business, the small businesses in particular in our city retail, uh, not just in our city, obviously across the world, <laughs> given this pandemic have suffered. You know, a big thing that a lot of data has shown and a lot of the top work we're doing is about, you know, downtown areas, central business districts. In Boston, obviously uh, a large city, we have many, uh, you know, smaller downtown village and town center sort of places. And, and something that you know, has proven over time and time again to be effective, both in creating more housing and helping the small business community is denser housing uh, in those areas. And it's a challenge in the city of Boston that we often bump up against is that if someone wants to build something, um, it is a long uh, and somewhat arduous process. And community input's important. Absolutely. I think resident neighbor of butter input often makes projects better uh, in the city of Boston. But it also having a process that can stretch for 12, 18, 24 months, really Sometimes longer, depending on the size of the project. Exactly. Years. Um, it can exclude, though, a lot of local, smaller uh, business owners, uh, developers, people from the community uh, in favor of sort of large national folks who can sort of sit there and, and pay the note. And it goes back to what I, one of the things I mentioned earlier is this process about having dedicated staff 
in City Hall to help people move things through. And again, having a butter meetings, having community meetings still, but it shouldn't take someone 18 months to get approved for, for a straightforward residential project. Do you have any thoughts on how we could improve that process? Um, yeah, either through no. staff or incentives, what do you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. And as an at-large counselor and your work on the city council brought you to many neighborhood meetings, many conversations and discussions about development, about growth in our city. And for everyone, the resident, the neighbor, the developer, the builder, the city, we need a more predictable process. We certainly need a more transparent process. And we need one that everyone can rely upon as um, a system that works, a system that is in place that is understandable, and that has, I think, very specific time restrictions put in place. Because we think about, you know, all of our desire, it's truly a collective desire to create more affordable housing in our city. Again, wherever that definition of affordability brings you, but certainly that is, I think, a, a general consensus across the board. But one of the one of the challenges to finding that greater affordability is uncertainty about the process. And the Boston City Council today is working on efforts to fast track 100% affordable projects across the board to lessen um, some of the requirements, to, to loosen up some of the requirements around the parking minimums as it relates to those developments. But we're still missing sort of that conversation around density bonuses and how do we incentivize and it can be improvements in the system. It can be partnership working with the city, especially around some of the use of our linkage dollars. And it could, you know, there's there's lots of way that ways that we can create that partnership to um, simplify the process, to fast track the process for the affordable growth in our city. But there also needs to be a conversation around really understanding where the nexus is between density and affordability and the speed in which we can get the housing stock built, inventory created in our city, because that's so important, but then also making sure that we've got high quality housing for our city's residents, that we are putting housing where our city's residents need it. You know, you know that I'm a former educator and spent 13 years in the classroom. And we talk a lot about the future of the education system, the future of the Boston public schools, as it relates to where population shifts are, where younger kids are, where families are growing, where they're not growing, where they're retracting in our city and making sure that we have school seats in those communities to respond to the needs of our families. The same is true for housing across the city. There is certainly a, a principle around if you build it, they will come. So if we build a certain type of housing, residents will, will move to that area. Um, but we have to, we, we can't just simply rely on that. We have to make sure that we are responding to in government plays, especially at the local level, a really important role in determining where that goes. We need to rezone our city. We need to do some real master planning as it comes to neighborhood by neighborhood um, future thoughts. Where do we see different parts of our city? How do we see them looking? What do we think that density is? What type of housing are we building? And Remember, remembering that our private sector, uh, big business in this city plays an important role in those conversations when we think about talent recruitment, when we think about new business and new opportunity coming to the city. And then I think part, part of the um, sort of the shifting demographics and the, G, the conversation around geography of our city, we can't simply focus on the downtown as our economic center. That are, we have these, as you mentioned, these villages and neighborhoods, these mini economies that are pretty impactful community by community across our city. We have to work with private industry to make sure that we're building housing where the workplace might be um, of the future. COVID has turned a lot of things upside down. Habits have changed. The way that we're um, showing up to work is different. I'm coming to you today from home. In a, in a past life, I'd be in a campaign office, but our campaign needs throughout this, this um, campaign season has been different because so much of what we do has been virtual. So we have to make sure that the marketplace is nimble and, and that's certainly the marketplace's role, but the government, the city has to be a, a real partner in making sure that, that the marketplace can respond quickly to the needs of the city's people and the ever-changing needs of the housing market in particular. 
So I think you made a really good good point here about how the different housing needs in different neighborhoods and different parts of the city. Um, you know, we're talking about increasing supply. That absolutely does not mean high rises, you know, everywhere. Uh, that just doesn't work. But what we do need to be thinking about, in my opinion, um, is those different types of housing. And, you know, is that something like accessory dwelling units or the ADUs or additional dwelling units, depending on the nomenclature, um, you know, in someone's basement uh, or in the backyard on some of the larger lots we have in some parts of the city. You know, there's been a pilot program around that. Um, San Francisco, some other cities in the Northwest have really been leading uh, on this, making sure that they're safe, habitable, um, but it provides perhaps another source of income for an elderly fit, you know, couple that is in their home that wants to stay there, needs the revenue or someone can have family in there or um, that sort of thing. Have you had much experience or rather, what are your thoughts on, on that pilot program, potentially expanding it where, where it might work in the city of Austin? No, we, we absolutely have to expand the ADU piece. We also have to create opportunities, more opportunities, or I guess it's not even, there is an opportunity there for families to maybe add on to their own, per, their, their home, their residence, to convert it maybe from a one to a two, not necessarily with an ADU, although I do support that. For too many of our residents, the process of doing that work is the same as if you're building that high rise tower, that you are jumping through very similar hoops, and there shouldn't be. There should be a multi-tiered, multi-track process for uh, the, you know, if you think about the zoning, the ZBA and the BPDA process, depending on the size of the project, the affordability of that project, I mentioned the, the work to fast track some of the 100% affordable um, uh, efforts across our city, but also on your private home. And we've seen with the ZBA this Thursday night um, uh, session for that's the, you know, the person in a one family or two family that wants to add a dorm or, or maybe bump out their kitchen or add a, a bathroom, whatever the case might be, some of these smaller projects to fast track it. But still for too many of our residents across the city of Boston, the effort to go through working on your own private home is a similar effort to redeveloping a whole city block. And we've got, we've got to make it easier um, to interface, to interact with the city of Boston. We have to streamline this process for sure. And I think when we do that, when we make the, the system more transparent in, in government and politics, we use that word quite a bit. When we use it easy, when, when we make it easier to interface with, to interact with, to do business with the city and the city's agencies, we will see more growth. We will see um, that greater predictability lead to what I hope is greater affordability across the city of Boston. And then where the city should, it should insert her, it to herself and say, let's create greater density in some of these corridors. Let's look for opportunities for more family housing. But I would argue that where we're looking to put more family-sized housing, we should also be looking for opportunities for more senior housing. Our older Bostonians who live today tremendously overhoused in many parts of our city, won't sell, can't sell, can't leave that to the next family to set down roots because there's nowhere affordable for them to go. And they end up sort of literally and figuratively trapped in their homes with ever increasing pro property tax bills. And we've got families that are leaving the city because there's no opportunity for them to you know, create that home that, and that, that sort of set down those roots here in the city of Boston. So we've got a lot of work to do. And certainly it's across the spectrum. You know, many people know the luxury high-end market will take care of itself. We, for the most part, see our extremely low income uh, marketplace taking care of itself, although we are seeing a, a tighter and tighter squeeze on, on that population. It is throughout the middle that we've got so much work to do. And we really have to double down on those efforts around sort of that middle income housing in the city of Boston, both rental and ownership. Although I am very much focused on creating these ownership opportunities because it also responds to the challenges around the wealth gap that exists in the city. We talk about legacy um, building and you know, all of those good things that happen for our families when there is home ownership um, as part of the family's dynamic.
Oh, absolutely. I think home ownership um, is a critical component of, of all of this. I want to go back to something you mentioned about rezoning um, and the challenges, you know, like you said, if you're doing a, a single family has to go through the similar gamut to, uh, you know, a 50 story high rise is, you know, as mayor, um, you would be appointing members of the zoning commission, the board of the BPDA, the ZBA, you know, have you thought about, you know, what philosophically, what sort of uh, approach you would take to filling those seats um, and, and how that plays into this, because you know, ultimately the Zoning Commission um, can make a lot of these changes. Yeah, yeah. Well, first, we need to take a look at how our city is zoned today and take, and, and I think in partnership with a master planning process, make sure that it is truly reflective of what we as a city see for ourselves in the future. As we you know, lead towards 2030, but really we should be looking at the 2050 numbers because 2030 now is just just around the corner for for us. Very soon. <laughs> and and I would you know hope to still be mayor in the year 2030. So we're laying the groundwork for um, for you know continuing to build our city again, literally and figuratively, so that it responds to the needs of our um, residents here across the city of Boston, and certainly provides for. Um, talent to, to be here in the city and take advantage of the economic opportunity that, again, Boston is the economic engine, not just for the Commonwealth, but for the region. So Boston becomes more and more attractive and more we see more and more people wanting to be here and live here. So we have to create those opportunities for them to do that. So, you know, rezoning is absolutely part of what we have to do. And, you know, we see the challenges with the ZBA today um, is this you know, every hearing, almost every applicant that goes before the ZBA has a significant list of variances that they're looking for. And we have to figure out, you know, sort of take a sort of analytical look at the variances that get asked for, where the exceptions are, are given. And, and we, we know sort of the story that if you go before the ZBA, that generally those projects are getting approved because we have so many demands on our city to continue to grow. So let's relook at our, at our zoning code. Let's take a, very, take a very critical look at what we expect from our city. We've continued to pit neighbor against neighbor and developer against resident. Um, let's set a code, put a code in place that really affirms that variances are variances. They should be truly exceptions to the rule not a matter of regular course at those weekly meetings. Separate out some of that affordability and let's let's move on that and, and take a look at the system and, and fix the parts that are truly broken. Yeah. And I think that that starts with um, rezoning the city and, and really doing some true master planning about what we see our city looking like in the future and making sure that we are respecting the historic, the historic nature of our entire city, that we are appreciating sort of the aesthetic feel of our neighborhoods, of our communities across the city, and that we are also creating opportunities for families to grow here, to live here, to make their home here forever. And then when we talk about the, the makeup and the, the look of the, the BPDA and the, the ZBA, certainly we need more community representation and an opportunity for neighbors, um, residents to really engage in this process beyond the civic meeting. And, you know, I think we also have to be very constructive and thoughtful about how we're, who we're inviting to the table around planning for the housing of the future. It can't simply be an academic exercise. It needs to be one that is truly rooted in reality um, and the realities of each one of our neighborhoods and then our city as a whole. Well, so that leads us into actually what is an audience question um, is, you know, what, the question is, what is your strategy to balance the critical need for increased housing production? Now, we all are here and we know we need more housing, but especially for affordable units with the challenges of, of a neighborhood that often yeah. opposes new housing. Um, how do you balance? I mean, you've obviously had to balance that to some degree as a city councilor. How do you, you know, plan to carry that uh, across the hall, uh, so to speak, if you're in the mayor's office and, and doing that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's still uh, an item that we're continuing to discuss in my capacity today as a city councilor, because we're all driven to create greater affordability across our city. And, you know, certainly it'll be a priority. It has to be a priority of mine as mayor. And so there's a few things that we're talking about when we talk about increasing affordability, increasing 
the opportunity for housing here in the city of Boston. It's investing in opportunities for our city's residents to be homeowners. So some of the very specific needs around down payment assistance, um, it has to be a part of what we do as a city. And the ownership piece is certainly around stability for the family, stability for the community and that legacy growth, the legacy opportunity um, for, for families. And we see, we'll see the impacts of that for generations, but we have to build it first. And we do have to find, again, that sweet spot, sort of the nexus point between the, how deeply affordable a particular unit or a project is and the number of units. And, and you know, the great debate around the, you know, the, 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 the inclusionary conversation around 13% affordable on projects over a particular size and how we are constantly driving towards increasing that goal. And, you know, elected officials and politicians and advocates have been, you know, rallying around making that number, that percentage very high. We've had calls for 50% affordability on, on projects. We've had calls for 60%. You know, we, we've had these very high numbers, but we do have to get to a place where there is a true nexus between the percentage of units that are affordable and making sure that the project can go forward. There's a real, real uh, an actual problem that we need to solve for. And then add in the variable around how deep the affordability is on that project to respond to the need. So there has to be flexibility within that. I do think we can work towards 20% affordability in these larger projects um, across the board, but then we still have that smaller conversation around driving down that AMI. So as much as I'd like to cast this sort of wide, broad brushstroke about deeper affordability and greater affordability project by project, it really does matter project by project. And we don't want to sacrifice the quality of development, uh, the quality of the type of housing that's being built here in the city of Boston for one more unit. And if we could make that one more unit at a deeper, afford a deeper level of affordability, that's good too. So it, it does. And that's where the BPDA, the zoning board, our housing agency, our planning agency, because I am committed to separating the planning out of uh, the development piece, because if we don't properly plan, we're just constantly in the state of um, sort of a responsive project at a project uh, at a time. And, and that creates another whole list of problems. But we have to find that sweet spot. We've got to create those opportunities for added affordability and deeper affordability, both in, again, that AMI piece and the number of units. And we have to do that in partnership. And I'm sorry, that's, I lost my train of thought there. I got sidetracked with one, one thought. That's where together um, we can have these discussions in community with those that are building the city and developing the city and the professionals, the experts in this field. You know, certainly the, the work that you're all doing, especially through the design of your blueprint can help us get to that point. Great. Thank you. No, I, I think you're right that there's there's a sweet spot. I mean, you said it, we're solving for a problem. Um, you know, there is a, a math uh, and the economics of, of building is really important. You know, one thing, uh, and this, uh, this is something I talk about a lot, but it also comes uh, from an audience question. Um, it is, you know, there's a lot of, I guess, um, what I often say is little a affordable housing. Yeah. That's really, and you know, it's not deed restricted. AMI is not the issue, but it is housing that's built that ends up being more affordable. So a lot of peer city, not a lot yet, but several uh, peer cities like Portland, Oregon, uh, Minneapolis um, have really taken the approach of allowing three family homes, you know, as of right uh, on almost any residential lot in the city, you know, removing that single family zoning. And, you know, you think about it, a three family on its own doesn't do much to solve the problem, but you know, you have a couple hundred of them, um, which as you know, and I think many Bostonians know historically, that was where middle-class working class families lived, uh, where they could build generational wealth um, in our cities in Mission Hill, a neighborhood I used to represent on the city council. That was a big part of, of the housing stock there. Um, what are your thoughts? Is that something you would look at as a pilot um, to allow, because right now, as you mentioned earlier, building a even a two-family, you have to go through the ZBA um, in, in most cases in the city of Boston. 
Well, first, um, I think I mentioned in my opening remarks, I grew up in a three family on the corner of Taft Street and Dorchester Ave. It also had that added storefront um, that was my grandfather's uh, TV repair business. My husband grew up in a three family here in Dorchester. We are, you know, street after street loaded with three families. And again, it was often uh, created not just generational wealth when we think about home ownership, but also generational family security. And in my own family, my grandparents were on the second floor, we were on the third floor, and we had a tenant on the first floor. When I got older, I moved to the first floor. And you know, we continue to live like that today. We have, that, that's Astro, he usually generally says hello. Uh, it's not in my office. This, this <laughs> generally <laughs> says hello. Um, and in my, you know, my family home today, it's my mother, my sister, and, and a family friend. And it creates sort of that natural affordability, that little a affordability in communities. And when, you know, we, we create more opportunities, especially the owner occupied multifamily experience in the city of Boston, there is nothing different than it. I, you know, I live in a one family now. I always imagined growing up in a three family, maybe someday I'd live in a two. So to be in a one family is just a very different experience for me, but my own children with their, their two grandmothers still living in three families, it to them, they say, wow, that's you know, such a different experience, but it is, it is the experience for sure of working families. And it is the housing stock and design that created opportunities for true, you know, for, for that affordability. I will, one, I will say as a child, I had a friend, just in a side story, but I had a friend that was one of 10 children. 12 people in the house, they lived in a three family. And so when I went over once after it was a summer camp friend, they had a spiral staircase in the middle that connected two floors just because they were such a large family. But that home ownership piece created that stability for their family. And, you know, that's, that's so important. And so many of our families have not had the ability to do that. And just it, I have been doing these meet and greets for at large counselors here at my home the last couple of weeks. And a friend of mine, a supporter of mine has been joining them to get to know these at-large candidates. And his question has been around home ownership. And he made the point, he said, you know, my family, black man, my family has been here for generations. And we talk about um, that the, the wealth gap between white families, black families, Latino families, $258, $0. And the it's almost always the asset of home ownership. So he says, you know, he remarks about the wealth gap and says, you know, my family has been here for generations. We own nothing. We don't have a stake in the soil. Yet they do because they've invested in this city, but we have to create those ownership opportunities because that stabilizes community, stabilizes family, stabilizes the person, in particular, the child. The children are where my, my most con concern is. So we do have to look at opportunities to create more multi unit housing in our city, especially housing that can be owner occupied. Um, and we have to create some flexibility within that zoning and, and looking to what our peer cities are doing for sure is, a, is an opportunity and making sure that we are looking at our city both as a whole when we think about these opportunities for rezoning, but then that we're also looking at some of the sort of the natural topography and makeup of a city where in proximity to downtown housing might be, but then also where in proximity to transit systems and thoroughfares that housing would be. Because something we hear about in every meeting is about traffic, is about the concerns around added population and what that density might mean around main travel corridors, um, and, and the impact on the transit system, which still unfortunately continues to fail us every single day. Well, thank you. Um, so going into the home ownership uh, discussion you had, and I think you framed it pretty well. Uh, we do have a, a question um, from the audience. Um, I love saying that, I feel like a game show host. We have a question from the audience here. Um, is that, um, it looks like it, the question is related to the town of Evanston, Illinois, where they framed uh, increased down payment assistance sort of as a form of, of reparations. Um, but however you want to frame it, you know, how do you see uh, down payment assistance programs? You know, the city's had a program for a long time. Yeah. It's recently uh, been added to. Um, there's probably opportunity to increase it more given the high cost of housing in this city. 
people need a lot more assistance um, from a down payment to put those roots down that you were saying. Um, what, what are your views on that? Do you have a number in mind? Have you thought about how we can increase this to give people the buying power they need to build that generational wealth to address that gap of inequity uh, across the city, often based on race? Yeah, so there's very specifically been an ask from Maha, which is one of the, you know, the city's advocacy organizations to increase the, that sta stash uh, program from, they, they've asked all the mayoral candidates to, to double that $325,000 to $650,000. I've committed to working towards a million dollars starting day one of our administration. It is that important to me that we are investing in programs like down pay, any down payment assistance program. And it's for our city's residents but it's also for our city's workers. When I think about the impact of residency, I'm a, I'm a believer in residency. I want our city's workers to live in the city, but Boston continues to be too expensive for too many, including those that work for the, the city of Boston um, the, the her, herself. I, I keep wanting to say that out loud. And for me, it's important that we're also supporting our city's employees, those that are going to work every single day um, on our behalf so that they can create a family or, or lay down those roots, create that legacy here for themselves. So for me, I think that investment will pay off um, and will sort of compound the imp impact, positive impact for not just the people, but for our communities, for our neighborhoods and for our city as a whole. So I think it's an investment that will have tremendous returns for us as a city. Thank you. And I wanna bring this back you know, to the um, supply question. <laughs> Um, yep. you know, at the end of the day, those increased costs, the fact that it's harder for people to afford to buy a home here, obviously, um, renting is incredibly expensive. You know, thinking about this through the lens of we need, there's incredible assistance, the federal government, we finally have an administration that believes uh, in helping solve this problem. But even with, you know, this influx of federal funds related to you know, uh, the COVID relief related to the infrastructure plan, which you know, is making its way through Congress right now, a lot of this still has to happen at the local level. Um, and a lot of it, you know, all the money that's being come down is not going to solve this on its own. Right. We need to be thinking about how to make this easier for people at all levels to produce and build new housing. And that's sort of the lens we're approaching this from is we need to do some of that work. So, you know, one of the questions, I think this is probably the last audience question we'll take. I know you have a busy schedule and I know other folks who are on here probably have to uh, get back, back to work as well. But, um, you know, the Imagine Boston 23, this is the question, um, was supposed to be a citywide plan, a master plan, a rezoning, but it was never codified uh, yeah. by the zoning commission. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? You mentioned rezoning, so you yeah. sort of already answered this, but how do we go from, these processes where neighbor, you know, neighbors commit a lot of time, advocates, elected officials commit a lot of time to this. Um, we need to get it put in the zoning. What are, what are your thoughts on that, council? Moving, moving from academic exercise to actual results. I mean, that's we've we've got to do that. We you know we see that unfortunately across government, across um, you know these these efforts, just bringing people together time and time again, and then doing nothing with it. So. You know, dusting, dusting that plan off, maybe tweaking it as necessary, 2030 is just around the corner. And then making sure that those pieces are truly a reality um, in which to, to govern from, to work from, those, those should be our policies. So, you know, there's, there's certainly um, a need to, to make that a reality for sure. And, and again, it has to be done in community, but we don't have a whole lot of time to waste. We spend sometimes too much time thinking about the study to do the next study. And it's, it's very frustrating. I'm you know, someone who sort of got my, my bearings in neighborhood activism and my local civic association and, and a few other things. And the conversations have to end and the work has to begin. And the city has to lead on that work for sure. But it has to partner with the organizations, those that have the specific expertise and the interest and the passion in doing this work. And you know, it's, it's part of why I'm here with you today um, because you should have play an important role in this work. It's, it's our city together and it should, you know, it should include the voices of the people doing the work every single day in order to guide it going forward. 
Um, I'm gonna ask one last question yeah. and then we'll wrap up. What would you do uh, on your day one or even your first hundred days? Yeah. What action would you be taking to increase the supply of housing in the city of Boston? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So on day one, on swearing in day, and you know because we have an interim administration, swearing in will happen as soon as the votes are certified. Uh, so we expect uh, that that will happen before Thanksgiving, and, and I look forward to look forward to that day. I will hang a banner on City Hall Plaza the day I'm sworn in that says Boston is open for business. And that's certainly about the response to COVID and, and the challenges we faced and the uncertainty we face as a city, but that's also about making it easier to do business with and in the city, how business interfaces with the city, how residents, our constituents, our visitors, how they interface with the city has got to be made easier, has got to be simplified, has got to be streamlined. And I'm committed committed to that work, so much so that we're gonna have a banner on City Hall Plaza that says so. But it's also, you know, I'm a former educator, I've made the promise within my first 100 days to have a strategic plan around Madison Park Vocational Technical High School. Within my first 100 days, we'll reconvene the pilot task force and the work around pilot is very directly related to education, but it's also directly related to housing because we know the impact that our institutions have had on our housing market across the city of Boston. And I've also committed to working starting day one on raising that million dollars around down payment assistance, but making it easier to do these things, bringing these folks to the table for these important conversations has to be part of the success for success to happen here in the city of Boston as it relates to all of these pieces. But that also setting a couple of goals, those 100 day goals really simplifies simplifies the, the work ahead. I will say because as mayor, I will be taking office likely right before Thanksgiving that the period between the preliminary, which is September 14th and final election day, which is November 2nd, transition planning needs to start. And on my website, we've rolled out some of our early or our initial housing goals. And a lot of my housing work is tied directly to my work against uh, working against homelessness here in the city of Boston. But transition planning has to start. So anyone listening today, Josh, you, uh, anyone affiliated with your organization, if you want to get involved in that transition planning, take a, take a look at the website. It's a dynamic document. Um, inform it. Uh, look at the other policy docs as well and inform those. But we will, we will start in, um, with some real effort, especially just after September 14th with that transition planning. So that day one, we can hit the round ground running uh, in support of our city's residents looking for housing and working in partnership with those who continue to build our city at all levels. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for your time today, uh, for your attention to you know, housing production uh, and really fostering a pro-housing environment in the city of Boston. I want to thank everyone who joined us here on Facebook Live and uh, submitted questions. I want to remind everyone that this uh, session, as well as all of our candidate conversations, will be posted on YouTube and on the Housing Forward website, which is housingforwardma.org. Please follow us on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, you'll be getting information about the other candidate conversations on Wednesday at noon. Uh, City Council Andrea Campbell will be joining us for a similar conversation. So thank you all for being here. Um, and your participation. Councilor, again, a pleasure to see you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day on the campaign trail. Um, thank you. And at work. I'm still a city councilor and at work. Absolutely, of course, and in City Hall. Um, but really, thank you. Uh, this is such an important conversation for the city's future. Appreciate your attention and your time today. Have a wonderful day. Bye, Josh. See you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.